Several stocks for companies focused on diagnosing, treating and preventing the coronavirus disease were soaring uh, on Thursday and shares of Genmark Diagnostics on the Nasdaq were jumping 25.8% higher. Core Diagnostic wasn't far behind with a stock of up to 20.4% and shares of Alpha Protec on the New York Stock Exchange were climbing 7.2% higher after rising as much as 15.9% earlier. And shares of BioCrest Pharmaceuticals were up 7.4% after vaulting as much as 20.2% earlier today. But how is the coronavirus affecting other markets? Let's ask Rikas Reardon, who is a portfolio manager at PSG. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome. Right. Well, there was uh, global economic posturing towards the end of 2019 that there was going to be a broad recession. Now that we are having coronavirus, should the situation get out of hand, could we be headed for a depression? Um, I don't think we're at that stage yet. You know, for um, the world economy to enter into a depression, you need a number of things. You know, you need stock markets to fall, which I know has been happening. And um, you also need a loss of confidence, which has happened to a certain extent. That's, that, that's two of the factors, for example, that's, that is sort of in play. And you also need a supply side shock, which is also in play. But, but the one thing that we haven't got, for example, is high inflation. Um, the loss of confidence depends on how long um, the setback as a result of the virus is going, to, um, is going to carry on. And that confidence is not because you're afraid somebody's not going to pay you if you've bought something or, or, or anything like that. This is a supply side problem where there's literally a hold up as far as production is concerned or the sourcing of materials to produce something is concerned. So we're not quite um, at that point where everybody is so negative that they just want to, you know, they are so um, convinced that prices are going to go lower as the global economy slows down, that they just want to sell as much as possible and basically flood the market and, and as a result of that, um, slow down global growth even further. Right. So we were talking about uh, shares in the pharmaceuticals soaring at this stage. Is this where the market could be heading? Most of that we have seen disinvestment in other shares and the equities and uh, you know, the direction towards the safe haven being gold, which has spiraled, uh, rather uh, surged higher. Are the pharmaceuticals an area to go to? I think, I think a lot of the pharmaceutical companies that are catching the spotlight at the moment are those that are very specialized in research and development of, of things like vaccines. Um, your other major pharmaceutical companies do have a problem because um, the the uh, material that they use to actually make medicine, the supply of that is at the moment being throttled. A lot of stuff is, is being made in China and also out of India. And for example, India has started, um, um, shall we say, stockpiling or actually f stopping the export of simple things like aspirin, for example, and, and between India and China, a lot of your big pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies, including, for example, um, aspirin in South Africa or something like Adcock Ingram, um, need those that, that, um, that material to manufacture locally. So um, it's not um, as if the whole sector is in a positive trend. It's very localized or it's, or it's very um, narrow was a very narrow focus. Right. So when we look at product productivity worldwide, starting with China, the automotive industry could be uh, hit quite hard. Yes, I think I think their production for the f for the second week in a row was down something like ninety percent. So at the moment, it's difficult to manufacture something in a factory if your if, you, if your worker can't get there. <laughs> if you understand what I mean, and and if. Um, your shipping has a problem as well because people are afraid to actually get into, get into contact with people that are importing and exporting. So in the short term, yes, um, there is a problem with that. Um, the question is obviously how long this virus is going to last. Now, when you look at people staying indoors, being afraid to go out because they may catch the virus, 
there wouldn't be so many walk-ins at shopping malls and people would be preferring to do online shopping. Do you see a surge in as far as that is concerned as well? I would, you know, in the short term, I would imagine so. But I think, you know, if, if that happens, it's got an it's got a interesting side effect. It is introducing people to online shopping that would never have considered it. it, it you know, and not, and not only shopping, for example, I was thinking of, th of things like online gaming. In other words, if you are secluded in your house, all of a sudden um, you, you are possibly going to do something that you've never done, whether it be online gaming, shopping, um, um, in other words, using the internet to do things that you would normally have done by climbing into a car or into a bus or walking somewhere and doing it. So. Apart from the short-term benefit, um, all of a sudden you've got a, a market of people that are doing things online that they would never have done before. Now, when you look at the airline industry, there could be a massive decline in bookings because people are now afraid to travel. Yes, I think, um, as, as the program said, about 113 billion estimate right now. Two weeks ago it was half that. So um, the airline industry... Um, is going to have a problem in the short term. Um, in Britain, I think it's called um, ReadyJet or something like that, is already, already has a problem because all of a sudden, um, you know, it's got no cash flow to, to, to operate with. I think a side consequence is that there's possibly um, going to be less planes in the air, which I think um, reduces their cost somewhat because the last thing you want to have is, a, is an aircraft flying half full because, I mean, it's, it's an immediate loss for every single yeah. empty seat you've got. And a ripple effect also on the tourism industry. Tourism is a, is, is a huge problem. You know, um, I think the estimate is that about 10% of the, of, of the global workforce is employed in um, travel and hospitality. So... Um, that's a huge amount of people that, that all of a sudden might have to stay at home and, the, and not deliver those services. So um, what I've read is it's about $330 billion worth of world trade per year that is under, under pressure at the moment. Mm. So I want us to go back to the oil price as well as uh, looking at how gold has been performing. Uh, just a little bit of a hint there. The, the, the issue of gold staying where it is more than the 1,500 mark and also looking at the oil price going to the $50 mark. Mm -hmm. uh, it was earlier at $49 but going up because of the decision of OPEC that it actually mm -hmm. thinks that they should uh, cut uh, supply so that they may control the price of uh, oil in the market. As, as again that, that, that news insert mentioned, Russia is the big fly in the wind pit because they've just, they, they're just saying, yet, no, they don't want to do that. So now the ball is back in Saudi Arabia's court. They've always been the swing producer, which means that they, they've always been the ones to cut back if, if, if there needs to be cutting back, according to OPEC, or supplying the market. So if Russia doesn't come to the party, then Saudi Arabia has got to decide, well, are they going to cut one, you know, are they going to cut what Russia doesn't want to cut? And at some point they might, Saudi Arabia might say, well, you know, because we're cutting to get a higher price, we might as well just pump as much as possible at a lower price. So um, although OPEC Plus has made that agreement, it really depends on whether Russia comes to the party at all. Right. Then... One cannot forget that earlier this week we had GDP numbers out and it was not good news at all because they came on the downside. Yes, um, far worse than expected. And I don't, you know, we had business confidence numbers yesterday, which was, which was looking quite good. But heaven knows what it's going to look like a month, two months from now, directly as a result of, of, um, of this virus outbreak. So we are having a double whammy. We weren't looking good before this outbreak and it is going to have an effect on numbers going forward. So the technical recession we are in, in other words, two, two months worth of um, negative growth, might turn into a, a longer period of that. But I, I still think that this whole virus thing depends on three factors, how, how, how global it's going to be, um, how long it's going to last, and, and, and how deadly it's, it's going to be. Now, we already know that, it's <laughs> that it is global. Um, we don't know how long it's going to last. If it's three or four months, then markets can look through that period. Um, if, it's, if it becomes deadlier than it is at the moment, then that's a different ballgame. 
But um, let's assume that everything is positive and it's, and it's contained or at least managed sort of for three, four, four months. Then um, you might have an unexpected pickup in growth also in this country. And that is basically because consumers have a tendency to, after a shock, after a trauma like we are having at the moment, they tend to go and do relief buying. You know, you know, you know I've survived, let me go and buy a car. It's very human. So I think there's also the risk of things surprising to the upside while we're also extremely negative at the moment. Right. Yes, let's leave it there. Thank you very much Thank for you. an insightful analysis and unpacking and dissecting the fraction of the aspects of the economy worldwide. Thank you very much.